Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons our planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. We have a returning guest this episode, Sarah McDaniel. Sarah is a CFA and managing director who heads the Wealth Strategies Group and Advanced Planning Centers in Morgan Stanley's Private Wealth Management Division. Her responsibilities include client engagement, as well as content generation and management of the Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management Trust, Tax, and Estate financial planning, asset allocation, and portfolio construction businesses. That one is a mouthful. Originally from Philadelphia, Sarah earned her BA in art history from Dartmouth in 1990. She previously worked in Christie's Trust and Estates Department, helping private collectors to create gift tax, estate tax, and insurance appraisals, in addition to determine selections for sale. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for having me. So our topic this week is a bit of a twofer, a tragic twofer, if you will. Carrie Fisher and her mother, Debbie Reynolds. Fisher was an actor and author, best known for her iconic portrayal of Princess Leia in the various films of the Star Wars franchise. She also wrote several uh, biographies and one-woman shows about her struggles with addiction. Uh, Reynolds was a legend of Hollywood's golden age, starring in classics such as Singing in the Rain, How the West Was Won, and her Oscar-nominated turn in The Unsinkable Molly Brown. She performed well into her 80s on stage and screen, picking up Golden Globe and Tony nominations also along the way. She was also one of the first major collectors of Hollywood memorabilia. Beginning in the 70s, she amassed a multi-million dollar collection, which included such iconic items as Charlie Chaplin's bowler hat and Marilyn Monroe's white subway dress, the one that sort of get blown up from the grate in that famous picture. Fisher unsurprisingly inherited the collecting book from her mother, similarly amassing large collections of Hollywood items which again is no shock given that, you know, the merchanting, merchandising juggernaut that Star Wars is, even if she wasn't a collector, just the stuff she had from the movies would probably be worth a ton. The collections themselves were even intermingled, as at the time of their deaths, Fisher and Reynolds were living together in a palatial Beverly Hills estate. Tragically, Fisher and Reynolds died only one day apart. Fisher passed at age 60 on December 27th, 2017, after suffering a cardiac episode on a transatlantic flight. Reynolds suffered a massive stroke the very next day and died at age 84. Fisher's estate was valued at some $6 million and Reynolds at roughly $80 million, with collectibles making up a significant chunk of both estates. Through trusts and due to the unusual circumstances of an unmarried mother and daughter both dying so close together in time, Fisher's daughter, Billy Lord, inherited the bulk of both estates and the valuable collections therein. The entirety of her mother's, as well as the portion of her grandmother's that was intended to go to Carrie Fisher, had she not predeceased her mother. Sarah, on top of the normal issues faced by anyone who suddenly comes into a great deal of money, particularly someone as young as Billy Lord, she also faces the issue of inheriting a pair of extremely valuable collections. What are some of the main issues clients face when planning for collectibles and other passion assets? Thank you very much for the question. And again, thank you for having me. When working with collectibles and other passion assets, exactly to your point, is collectibles are the epitome of a passion asset, and they reflect the economics of taste. So particularly with collectibles, unlike other fine art, and if I could kind of put a delineation, and there's no perfect definition delineating the one from the other, but generally, when people think of fine art, they think of unique pieces, perhaps a painting or a drawing. And when you think about collectibles, you think of things that are potentially created in a series or multiples. They tend to be somewhat less um, valuable just because there are many of them rather than a unique piece. And because there are many of them, the the value relies or lies within the condition 
as well as the provenance and the authenticity. So in working with a big estate such as this, or these two big estates, with a lot of collectibles, there are a lot of potential complexities that come in. So what I would say is the neat thing about collectibles is that there are multiples of them. So they might be easier to value because other ones may have been purchased or sold and you have more direct comparables. That's why the condition makes um, such a difference. It's also then if we get to authenticity, and in this case is that if it's coming directly from Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher, the question of authenticity is probably not raised um, because they are actually the, the, the people who were using the pieces as, as part of their, um, their roles and their profession. That actually contributes to value as well. And then hopefully then, given all the time that Debbie Reynolds spent curating and taking care of all of these pieces that she had and her daughter had collectively, is hopefully then they're in really good condition. Now, what's interesting here is we happen to be um, in this family, it happens to be great that Carrie Fisher is just as interested in collectibles as her mother, Debbie. Um, what I wonder though is hopefully then Billy is as well, because effectively what happens is with collectibles, because it's a passion asset and it's the economics of taste, fads come in and out of style. So if Debbie Reynolds had this estate and didn't wasn't affiliated with Carrie Fisher with the Star Wars franchise, how reputable would Debbie Reynolds be in her own right? In my opinion, she would be. But if it's a subsequent generation that's not as familiar with her, then that provenance doesn't work out as well. So what I'm trying to say here is Billy Lord may or may not be as interested in the collectibles. Um, hopefully she is because it's her mother and her grandmother, but may not have the same kind of affiliation or the mission and drive that the two of them have to preserve them over time. She also may not have the points of connectivity with the auction houses and the collectors who also collect and aspire to have these pieces to be able to, if she wanted to, and in this case they did dispose of the assets through the sales. So what I would say is between Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher and kudos to Debbie Reynolds because she had the will, she had the trust. Even though her daughter um, predeceased her, the, the trust went to her granddaughter. And she'd also done sales previously um, because she was unable to set up a foundation. And with the sales previously, she earmarked the money for her family, but then also charity. So the charity was um, designated and people knew what her wishes were, as well as she also knew the auction house and the, the people who would then help her liquidate that part of the collection. Thus, it made it easier, albeit she's lost two loved ones, for her to understand what to do with the collection because there was a mission, there was a vision. She knew where and how to sell it along with her uncle, Todd Fisher, or um, with her uncle as well as part of the process, Todd Fisher. And she knew the vision, she knew the mission, she knew how to dispose of the assets and the estate structure was in place so that all of that could take place. So the loved ones who remained could actually grieve um, the death of their loved ones. Yeah, that's a really interesting point here, Lydia. The idea that it's an advantage that the family, we just talk about them collectively, I guess, had already gone through the sales process um, beforehand. Whereas, you know, a lot of times, like a, a, a decedent who's sort of a, amassing his collection his entire life and it's just kind of sitting there and they've never actually thought about selling it. And so at the time of death, there's none of these connections. There's none of that. Like the Debbie Reynolds the time she's had to sell her assets some of her collection collectibles it was actually like it's its own fun little story where you know she used to keep them in the hotel and casino that she owned until that went under and then it was in a museum in uh los angeles and eventually there was some big plan to move the whole thing i think to pigeon forge tennessee which is where dollywood is and uh, mm -hmm. once that fell through she had to liquidate uh, a large part of her uh, a, a large part of her collection to sort of pay for the you know all the problems so that, like, that's its own podcast almost there with how crazy that kind of got. But it's, it's to Billy Lord's advantage that, you know, these connections were made as opposed to if Debbie Reynolds had been sort of quietly collecting these things in her attic and never thinking to sell them. Absolutely. And if I, uh, you could take it one step further is that it's unfortunate that Debbie Reynolds wasn't able to get the funding, right, to keep to keep a museum in place and keep it funded over time. But you can imagine, though, if, if she was able to do that, and the museum's in place, and the two of them passed away, and Billy Lord didn't want to be involved with the museum, right, on an ongoing basis, what a legacy that would have left with her, not only with a namesake with her, her mother and her grandmother, but then the 
responsibility of effectively running a museum, which is like running a business on top of her own um, uh, career in, in film and in, in the movie business. So yes, it's the, while it's unfortunate that Debbie Reynolds wasn't able to get the funding to get the museum in place, a happy accident from that is then she could use her connections and their connectivity and her name, right, as part of the sale. And that's what I mean by provenance. It's not only the provenance of the movies that it came from in MGM, it's the provenance of her actually holding um, the, the collectibles directly, right? There's a direct line, it's traceable. And it's not only her name, it's the combination of her name and her, her daughter's name. So you're actually blending two generations of Hollywood um, fans to have them overlap and potentially make the sale even more successful. Yeah. And then on top of their own reputations as stars, there's also the reputations they amass as just highly reputable collectors, right? Well, not every collector is going to be a movie star. That, ha that happens to be the case here. But you know, for the pr purposes of provenance, you know, it, I have to imagine that Debbie Reynolds is one of the most respected movie memorabilia collectors in the world. So anything that came from her, even if she wasn't already famous, would sort of have its own level of authenticity just because it was in her collection. That, that's absolutely right. So she was creating right, her own provenance, provenance and it helped her with the sales during her lifetime. But then with the settlement of her and her daughter's estate on behalf of Billy Lord and Tom or Todd Fisher is just remember then is now you have not only what came directly from the movies, now you have three generations of Hollywood folk, so to speak, and right, all amassed and collectively sold together. So everyone's benefiting from each other's kind of prestige um, and the cross fertilization of fans. They did the same thing with their real estate, which I think is really clever too, is rather than send, sell one house versus the other, is by putting them together and building off of both of their names, right? Think of the provenance that they've actually attached to that house, let alone the, the prior owners of the house, which were, who were also famous. So there's a lot of prestige and image involved in all of this, which is valuable. It's hard to measure the value, but all we know is that, you know, you only need two people that are interested in a piece or in a home, right, to actually drive up the price. So that's what getting back to the beginning with the economics of taste is a lot of collectibles can potentially be fickle, right, depending on one generation likes one suite of films and another generation likes another suite of films. And if you're trying to sell from one generation to the other and they don't respect, right, or know or understand or appreciate, that might be harder to do. But this is unique because you have multiple generations kind of tying in um, their, their good name to making it even more outstanding and, and, and driving that value home. I'm glad you're sort of bringing it back because we have kind of jumped to the end of the story. We're putting the card a little before the horse here with the, okay, well, now we're selling it. There's, like, there's a lot that has to happen before you get to the point, if you ever do, of, of selling it. So I think maybe to go all the way back to the beginning, we're talking about you know, the economics of taste Let's just talk about valuations for, for a minute. What is that collectibles, passion assets context? Sure. If we're talking about passion assets, it's generally very nostalgia driven and experiential. So depending on, it's, it's basically a supply and demand thing is that if there are many people who want a few limited objects, then it can drive up the price. Generally what happens though with collectibles is again, it's the, because there tend to be multiples of them and there's no kind of um, set market, should I say, or sorry, the like with fine art, you might have a catalog raisonne for an artist where they catalog everything that the artist has done. So you have the authenticity, right? And you know the title, the transfer of title over time. Because the collectibles market is so vast and diverse, right? There's they're lower valued items. So it's more democratized and more people can be in the market and actually if I think back to my nieces and Beanie Babies, right? They have a whole basket full <laughs> like of Beanie like Babies. the ultimate example point, for everyone, are the Beanie Babies. <laughs> right? So the, on the one hand, like everyone was dying to get the Beanie Babies. And now like people don't know what Beanie Babies are. And unfortunately, they didn't sell them. But so we still have a basket full of Beanie Babies. Anyway, the point being is, the, um, is that anyone potentially could create a market for collectibles, depending on what they like. And because of the technology, right, more people can do this. So you can think of almost anyone being their own market maker for collectibles, if they can actually find or quantify or show that these pieces are valuable. So it's the, the technology provides access, the technology 
provides pricing in a, or pricing efficiency. It also um, gives access not only to the people who are selling, but then to the people who are buying. But because it's there are lower barriers to entry, the collectibles market over time tends to be pretty fickle. Um, there are some collectibles that have um, sustained the, the passage of time, like, and again, you might laugh at me, like automobiles. At what point is that fine art versus a collectible? Jewelry. Uh, you might talk about wine. And they're all different connotations with each type of collectible. Um, so as far as valuation, it's the, hey, can you make a market? Are there people who want to buy it? Can you get pricing efficiency so people feel more comfortable that what they're getting is a good price? Um, all understanding that it's not as formed of a market. So people have to really be careful about doing their own research, um, figuring out a way to figure out whether it's authentic or not. For example, wine, right? And there are a lot of people in the wine business, but anywhere from five to 10% of wine is, is fake, right? It's not real. Um, so you have to be really careful, even in something that's well established as wine. And you have to be willing to, hey, what you think is actually really valuable now, and it may be for a year or two, is maybe in five years, if you still hold it, there may not be an audience who finds it valuable. So I'll go back to what I've said in the past is you should buy things because you like them and they have intrinsic value and experiential value for you because it's much easier to buy things than necessarily to sell. And depending on your holding time period of the asset, it may be that things come in and out of favor over time. Yeah, and I think that that's a really interesting concept, right? The idea that different types of collectibles have different levels of sort of price permanence. Whereas like a classic car is something like, you know, the taste from it has been established effectively. And while the, the price may fluctuate within you know, from year to year, there's going to be a certain base value of this is a valuable car because this is a quote unquote classic car versus Beanie Babies, again, which is sort of like was a craze and then, you know, just died out because people stopped caring. But it's entirely possible, especially when you're dealing with these sort of nostalgia driven items that like, you know, the people who were kids who went crazy for Beanie Babies, then they weren't, then they got rid of them when they moved out of their house or they weren't worth anything. But, you know, when those kids become 30 or you know, 40 or whatever, and they have all this disposable income, and they want to recapture some nostalgia, like it's entirely possible that you see Beanie Babies magically become worth money again. Absolutely. And even if, if we build off of the cars, right, versus the wine and the, the collectibles, is the cars, they're, they're part of the experience is can you drive it? So some people are faced with the, the conundrum of, do I put in a new part in an old car so I can drive it? Because the being able to drive it and the experience and the resale value there may or may not be more or less than do I leave it authentic, right? But I can't drive it because the parts aren't available anymore. So you have all these kind of like give and takes of the, uh, hey, if it's a passion asset and it's experiential, how valuable is the experience and having it work versus the potential authenticity and purity of it, right? If you want to sell it at a later date. The really interesting conundrum is with wine is do you drink it or do you hold on to it? Right? This is it's, the, the and with all collectibles, it's one of these more things more valuable than the resale value. <laughs> it's one of these things where you roll your eyes almost at it if you're not like in the in, in that particular collectible world, right? Where it's like, should I drink this wine that's you know, worth money because it's supposedly super good? Or do I hold on to it? And the same thing, do I drive this amazing car I have or do I just let it sit there and stay and make it? It's like taking toys out of the package. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's it, absolutely for someone it, that, who's not engaged in that exact sort of aspect of collecting, it seems so silly. But that stuff actually really matters. It, it absolutely does. Is that what's the value of the utility while you own it versus the value of it being pure if and when you want to sell it? And that's a very personal decision. And that's why I get back to buy what you like, do with it what you like, because a lot of it's the enjoyment factor. And who knows, right? Maybe when it comes a time when you want to sell it, maybe no one else wants it or the fad has gone away. So that's something that everyone has their own kind of inherent risk profile um, and their cost benefit analysis that goes on in their head with these, these fun passion assets um, to determine what they want to do. If I could also mention too, is if people sell um, collectibles, capital gains tax isn't 20% like other financial assets. It's actually 28%. So it's, it's a higher um, cost to uh, of with the capital gains. And what I'd also say too is this, 
even though these assets tend to be lower price points, except maybe cars and some of the wine, but generally collectibles tend to be lower price points, it doesn't mean that the transaction costs are low as well. Um, while the technology helps right, um, to be more cost effective, sometimes disposing of the asset, A, if you can get the price point, but also then the cost and the transaction costs around it might be more than otherwise people would expect. Um, and that might be a an unpleasant surprise to people as they move forward. Yeah, I mean, you actually um, anticipated pretty nicely my next question there by, by bringing up capital gains. And the whole point being that, you know, when we talk about valuations, it's not just for, like it is for sale, but these are also just very important for tax reasons. And so is there some way, like, how do you go about finding someone to value these items? Or is there a, a, a professional designation where like if I see, you know, for instance, CFA after somebody's name, I know certain things about them. I know that they're reliable in certain ways that maybe somebody who doesn't have that designation um, is not. Um, is there sort of for valuations experts in these fields sort of a similar thing or is it kind of you're going out into the wild to find the one weird guy who's the super expert on whatever happens to be your passion? Well, it depends what the collectible is. So it's a combination of both, which is probably not the answer that you want. There are at least three different appraisal organizations that have designations for standards of appraisal um, to keep up with like what the IRS needs for tax purposes and, and appraisals. However, with collectibles, right, if the, um, for example, costumes, so actually let me compare if like if you have a paintings expert and it's a contemporary painter, there are probably hundreds of people who are really good at the valuation of that contemporary painter. If it's a costume, right, or if it's Marilyn Monroe's dress, right, when she's on the grate, how many people actually are experts in costumes, let alone that particular costume? Um, so it might be to your point is that it's hard to put a valuation on something um, that doesn't come to market that often, because there's, there's one of the, is there a comparable? How old is the comparable? How many potential buyers are there? Um, how deep is this market, right? And the more and more kind of you get into that is the, right, when we know is value is the, you know, the risk you're willing to take. And if um, the fewer the buyers, right, the lower the value potentially. And it's also, um, again, gets to the authenticity in the title as well. So there are appraiser organizations. They're fantastic, right? Many people are then have their designations to your point is it's called USPAP. Um, it's like having a, well, it's another designation like a CFA, but to the extent that it's the bowler hat, right? Charlie Chaplin bowler hat. How do you value that, right? Is that how much does a bowler hat cost, but then what is the value of the provenance of him having it, but then also this three generations of family having it as well. And there may only be one or two people who would be willing to put a price on that or to figure out how to put a price on that. So as part of collectibles and valuations is, you want to understand the value of what you own so you can plan accordingly. But depending on how bespoke or specific or unique what you own is, it might be harder and harder to get those values. Sometimes you go back and forth with the IRS, um, maybe not necessarily with collectibles, but with other things, because they might see it as like a museum piece and say it has unlimited value. But then if you're an appraiser, You'll say, but no, yeah, there might be two or three people in the world who want to buy it. So it's actually not of that value. So you get a little push pull um, to your point of what is fair market value for some of these collectibles. It's much easier, as you would imagine, if there are comparables in the market and that lends to collectibles. But if they've been held in this provenance, right, with the Reynolds and the Fisher and Lord for so long and they haven't been on the market, it's an educated guess as to what the value might be. Yeah, I think, I think this idea of fair market value is really important to nail home also because of how fickle and sort of as well-defined as it is, it's completely undefined in a weird way. Um, I think like a very famous example of sort of people fighting with the IRS over this and a ridiculous one uh, is actually the art connotation. There's a, the Rauschenberg case where um, you know, there was a Robert Rauschenberg piece that had a, a bald eagle on it and like incorporated yeah. into the piece. And uh, so when he passed, that was the piece was worth you know valued by the IRS as worth being worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and so the, the family got hit with this giant tax bill for passing on this you know, four hundred million dollar painting or whatever. But because of black market sale laws, because you're not allowed to sell items that feature in endangered species, the thing was unsellable. So it was the, sort of this weird catch twenty two that was created of this is worth 
an enormous amount of money on the quote unquote fair market value, but actually you can't ever sell it because there's no market for it because it's illegal to sell it. And so that's like an extreme example of sort of the ridiculousness. But you know, when you, with the IRS, you can get into you know determining a fair market value is not like just think, I think it's worth ten dollars. I think it's worth fifteen. Okay, we'll call it you know twelve and a half. It's it's really can be quite a quite a big production and can be quite costly. And no pun intended. There's an art to valuation. <laughs> right. I see what you did there, yeah. uh, thank you for laughing. Right. It's, it can be a building block approach of like the medium, the artist, right, the time and the condition, but then, right, is one plus one two, or is one plus one five of how all those different factors come together to determine value? Building off of your point too, what we've also started to see, and part of the art market, maybe not necessarily the collectibles, but you brought up the, the Rauschenberg with the, the eagle, the bald eagle, is sometimes different jurisdictions um, say things are national treasures, so you can't even get them out of the country. For example, some war halls in some European countries are designated national treasures. So if you buy it and you can't get it out of the country, how valuable is that? You know, what's so the fair market value for a thing that, that by definition can't be moved or sold? <laughs> exactly. So on the one hand, it's valuable. On the other hand, you can't, you've limited your audience to whom you could sell it. So it's lost value potentially. So you know, when we're talking about sales and um, you know the sort of situation that Billy Lord found herself in, um, we're kind of talking about the idea that you know, it's important to ensure, you know, to hope that, that she's also into it when you, when you leave, you know, she being the uh, inheritor, when you leave someone mm-hmm. a collection. And this is a similar, you see this in like a lot of the, the philanthropic issues where like you leave a charity to your kids and because I've raised charitable kids and I, you know, they're just going to want to take over my charity that I've created. And it's like, well, you know, you may have raised charitable kids, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're into your exact charity. And they, maybe you actually are saddling them with something as opposed to doing them you know, the grand favor that you think you're doing. And, and collectibles can kind of be the same way. And that even if, you know, Billy Lord is herself a, a collector, there's no guarantee that her interest lies in anything to do with her mother and her grandmother's interests. So even if she were to sort of inherit this uh, collection and, and really be able to take care of it, she may not even want to. That, that's exactly true. So when we work with clients generally with any asset they have, and then with art in particular, is... and it's not only the intergenerational planning, right? It's also, are you philanthropic or not? And I'll try to tie the two together is what generation one wants doesn't mean that generation two wants it. And again, there's a different assignment of value there. What I always say is that if you have a strategy, you have to communicate it. And the, the viability of the strategy is the acceptance of it by all the people that you need to work through and to implement. So said another way, to your point, if gen two doesn't want it, and Gen 1 wants to give it to Gen 2, we've got a problem. But that's something that we could potentially work through is maybe it's the maybe it's not the asset, it's what you do with the asset where there's a difference um, of opinion and view and mission. What was nice about Debbie Reynolds and, and, and Carrie Fisher and hopefully Billy Lord is her, her vision and mission was the, the maintenance or the preservation of old Hollywood. So that could be a big open-ended mission that Billy Lord could take on and say, hey, let's preserve maybe not old Hollywood, let's preserve Hollywood as it is now. So it becomes, it could potentially become an intergenerational theme that's not specific to one generation, but then can be passed on and modified according to the generation that's fulfilling the expectation. So they make it their own, they're more passionate about it and moving forward. If I may, Sometimes what happens, too, is people assume that, oh, I'll give it to a museum. But people need to be very careful about um, courting museums because it is definitely a courtship is don't assume the museum wants the pieces that you have. And it may not be because there's, you know, they might be the best pieces in the world, but if they're not congruent with the collection and the holes in the mission, right, of the museum, it doesn't make sense for the museum to accept those pieces. They might be courting another collector. So when we work with clients, what we try to understand is what are your expectations, goals, vision, mission? And then we try to work with them to figure out what is the actual viability of actually implementing. And oftentimes, and generally um, what I've been told is the what's in museums, it's only 10% of the collection is actually on view. So even if the museum does potentially say, yes, we would love to have your pieces, then you have to discuss, will they be on view? 
Will we get signage with our name on it? Will it be rotating? Is there potential for it to be deaccessioned? And these are all things that we need to actually think through. So getting back to your question with, hey, does Billy Lord want it? Hopefully, right, the, the three generations talked about the collectibles, right? What they mean to the first two generations, and I would imagine, but cannot attest to, is the, the sentimentality of the two generations with Billy Lord. I think that's why she and her uncle, Todd Fisher, actually went through that subsequent sale and auction um, because they, as, as uh, Debbie Reynolds said, is that now's the time to give everything I love back to my fans so they can create their own collection. So it's like a natural cycle of life, which I thought was nice in the research and the things that I read. So I went a little bit all over the place there is that I think um, if Billy Lord didn't want it, um, that would be challenging. But I think because the three generations and the estate planning was so well thought out and we had the happy accident of the museum not panning out is Debbie Reynolds had to do the work herself to figure out how you could potentially dispose of these assets and sell them over time. And she was able then to be philanthropic. She was able then to give back to her fans and the public that cherished her and potentially cherished all the pieces that she had been a conservator of for so many years. Well, first of all, we love all over the place on this show. That's kind of our stock and trade. And second, <laughs> you know, you brought up this idea also, and you're talking about communication and this idea of planning for what the f the future generations are going to do with the art. And that's more than just, you know, and you, you alluded to this very much earlier in the podcast. It's more than just, okay, well, what's our legacy and what what is our mission with this art and who's going to get it? It's also... What does it take to take care of this? And that's actually like sitting down and doing math. You know, it's like, okay, well, it's going to cost this person X amount of dollars to maintain this collection going forward. And we need to provide for that. We can't just drop the collection in the lab because then you, know, you end up with the situation sort of like, um, you know, we did the Barnes uh, Museum a few weeks ago on an episode. And that was, we had this, this massive plan for everything about his museum, but didn't include anything about really how to pay for it. So and once they ran out of money, they were put in a very awkward position. Um, so, and that's kind of the same thing here, uh, you know, on a lesser scale, probably, but you know, when you leave your giant collection to someone and you haven't done the sort of the research and to leave them with the, uh, the correct resources to maintain the collection, or at least allow them to sell pieces to maybe maintain the collection that you know, you're sort of hamstringing them from the get go. Uh, I agree. And that's effectively what happened to Debbie Reynolds is she had, you know, she paid, I don't know whether it's millions of dollars for some of the collection from the MDM sale in 1970, but they said that she had something like uh, 3,500 costumes, 20,000 photos and posters. Is the, the photos and posters, right, are flat and could probably be put in sleeve drawers. But can you imagine 3,500 costumes and the, the cubic the meter space to actually house them? Um, and the, the curation of that is, so I agree, is that how much space do you need to actually store them in a climate and in a manner that's you're not eroding the value, i.e. that you're keeping the integrity and they're not in the sunlight fading or they're not being flattened. And so now there's a crease um, in some of the, the, the costumes is that how do you maintain that? Like what, how much storage do you need? How many people do you need for the security? How much does it cost to ensure? Um, what about the climate control? Effectively, some of the, if you have a really big collection, not only fine art, but collectibles, it could be a negative cash asset. So what do you do then is with the rest of your portfolio to figure out how much does it cost to maintain this collection in a manner where um, condition equals value to maintain the value of the collection? And at what point does that potentially put your other assets um, in not in jeopardy, right, but impose too much of a demand on the rest of the assets that are more cash flowing to offset the other asset? And Debbie Reynolds bumped into that. She effectively, in one of the pieces I read, said, I decided to be rich. Is that I was, had this illiquid asset um, that I knew that was valuable, but I couldn't maintain it because I didn't have the cash flow elsewhere. So I decided to sell it, part of it while she was alive, so she'd have enough money for she, her son, daughter, and her granddaughter at the time. So absolutely, the cash flow and the opportunity cost of being in an, Ill in an illiquid asset is critical as part of the decision-making process. 
And this idea of illiquid assets is obviously, you know, especially prevalent, you know, now that, you know, sort of we're living through a pandemic and people all of a sudden are, you know, looking for any money they can find. It's like, well, hey, I have my super valuable collection, but nobody can come look at it because it's covered in coronavirus and everyone's freaked out. You know, so it's like, this is sort of, you know, kind of a perfect example of, of why the planning is important and why how difficult sort of having so much tied up in such a liquid assets can be. Absolutely. And with other potential fine art, you might be able to borrow against the asset. You might be able to borrow against collectibles, but that think about the, the complexity without that, right? It's, it's a port, even more of a portable asset. There are fewer comparables. It doesn't turn over as much as that. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would actually give you a loan against that asset just because it's, it's a little bit more precarious and peculiar um, how you would understand like the value and the servicing of the loan. Well, Sarah, I'd like to thank you for coming on. We're just about running out of time here, even though I know this conversation, as vast as the collectible world is, could go on basically forever. Well, I appreciate your time, and thank you for the conversation. And uh, for all our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me, on the next episode of Celebrity Estates. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.